Hello everyone, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar, welcome to lecture 28 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In earlier lectures, we have discussed about what are the different plates available across the globe and because of relative motion between the plates, some plates are moving towards each other, some tectonic plates are moving away from each other and some plates there is horizontal movement between the plates. As a result of this, there will be zones in which there will be accumulation of strain energy. When the stored energy is exceeding the in situ strength of the material, when this particular situation arises, the material which is available at the interface will undergo failure in terms of maybe rupture, melting. As a result, different kinds of seismic waves originate from the source that is the focus and start radiating in the three dimensional space away from the focus. When these waves interact with the medium, there are heterogeneity which are present in the medium. Secondly, because this scattering is happening in three dimensional space. Thirdly, because when seismic waves are passing through a particular medium, there are oscillations, there are shearing happening in the material. So, because of scattering, because of heat, because of heterogeneity present in the material, there will be reduction in the energy which wave was carrying particularly related to particle oscillation at larger distances. So, if you are talking about certain recording station which is very close and a recording station which is at may be 100, 200 kilometer away from your focus or epicenter, definitely the characteristics of ground motion at close by recording station at another recording station located at 200 kilometer that will be significantly different. Though both the ground motions or both the recording station are generating ground motion corresponding to the same earthquake happened at the same epicentral location. Then later on we discussed that these waves will also get interacted with near surface soil medium depending upon the shear strain which the vibration is inducing in a particular soil medium, the soil is going to offer resistance in terms of primarily the shear modulus, secondly the damping ratio. So, depending upon these two parameters which are available at a particular value of shear strain, the soil is going to offer resistance and accordingly the vibration characteristics will change when the incident wave is passing between the bottom of a particular soil layer to the top of that particular soil layer. Subsequently, this revision and change as well as modification in the soil characteristics as well as in the uh, ground uh, motion characteristics will happen between the bedrock and the surface. Finally, once the ground motion are reaching at the surface, which, which we can also find out using ground response analysis. We have also uh, discussed in earlier lectures about what are the different kinds of seismic waves, which are present starting with body waves, surface waves and how the information about different kinds of wave can be used in accordance with the one dimensional equation of motion, apply boundary condition and this way we will be able to find out how much is the transfer function, how much is the change in the amplitude of motion at different frequency content. In a nutshell, we discuss about ground response analysis which will help us in identifying that how the ground motion are modifying by each of the soil layer existing between the surface as well as between the bedrock. So, because of this modification in the uh, ground motion between bedrock and the surface, sub subsequent modification in the bedrock motion will happen when it reaches to the ground surface. Now, at the ground surface you might be having uh, soil medium. So, depending upon what is the shear stress, ground vibration modified ground motion at the ground surface is inducing and how much is the in situ shear strength of the soil. Soil again at the ground surface will offer resistance, it may undergo ground subsidence, it may show some sign of liquefaction. So, in earlier lectures we discussed about what is ground response analysis, what are different kinds of seismic waves, how these seismic wave information one can use to find out the ground motion characteristics modification by different soil layers. Finally, at the surface because of modified ground motion there will be additional stresses which will be generated in the soil medium. If the soil is relatively soft, it may undergo failure. Critical example is uh, liquefaction. 
where again the soil will lose all of its shear strength and it almost flows like a liquid. In such a case, when the soil has lost all its shear strength, which was there during static loading condition, anything which is located on the soil, whether it was a simple vehicle or any other kind of superstructure, it will not be able to withstand that particular load. The superstructure or the car will start sinking into the ground. So, that is part of induced effect of earthquake. Whenever we say about induced effect, that means whenever earthquake loading, whether it was direct loading or excessive ground shaking because of amplification in the soil medium by local soil, because of this modification, which is not directly happening because of earthquake happening at the source, but subsequent modification as well as the characteristics of uh, in situ soil condition. Similarly, in case of slope also, in case of uh, uh, tunnels also, in case of superstructure also. So, depending upon the characteristics of each of these systems, how much resistance these systems are offering to external loading condition, which came into existence primarily because of earthquake generated vibrations that is called as induced effect. Later on, we discuss about primarily related to liquefaction, what are the parameters which will help in identifying whether a particular site is prone to liquefaction or not and how that can be used to find out the effect of safety against liquefaction and subsequently maps one can develop which are basically identifying the regions which are prone to liquefaction which are not prone to liquefaction. Later on we discuss about seismic microzonation which will give a combined effect of what are the locations which are relatively safe or relatively having low component of hazard whether you talk about bedrock seismic hazard, whether you talk about ground motion, whether we talk about liquefaction and landslide, tsunami, what are the potential uh, induced effects at a particular site of interest. So, in the end we, we started with earth, uh, we started with the uh, lecture 1 about uh, different layers of the earth and in the end till lecture 27 we were discussing about. Uh, seismic microzonation. Later on, we discussed also about uh, landslide and its classification. So, overall, based on the understanding so far, what we have learnt is keeping in mind there are different seismic sources in and around of your study area, in and around of your project site, and each of these seismic sources, which are faults, primarily we are talking about active faults, which have been producing repeated earthquakes of different magnitudes from time to time keeping that seismicity into account. Now, we have to design a particular structure, which has to be exposed for at least the design life of the structure. You can consider maybe 25, 30, 35 years, whatever is the type of structure and corresponding to that, what is its design life. So, there is a structure which is being there, uh, which is about to be constructed at a particular site and once this is kept in position it will be exposed to different kind of seismic scenario. Some scenario may be at 10 kilometer distance, some might be at 100 kilometer, some might be very active, but located at 300 kilometer epicentral distance. Now, whether it is at 5 kilometer, 10 kilometer, 100 kilometer or 500 kilometer, whenever there is an earthquake, each of these sources will transfer seismic loading to the structure. If a very small magnitude earthquake is happening very close to the site, that can also contribute to significant earthquake loading. Similarly, if larger magnitude earthquake or great earthquake is happening even at 300 kilometer, 400 kilometer radial distance from the site, that can also produce significant vibration at your site of interest. So, depending upon your building uh, construction material, depending upon the vertical similarity in the building, depending upon the similarity which is there in the plan and depending upon uh, uh, the, the frame structure depending upon the health of uh, load bearing members, one can have a rough idea about whether when this particular building will be subjected to an earthquake loading, whether the building will have chances to undergo minor cracks, it will not show any kind of distress or it will undergo complete collapse. So, it is like we are discussing about earthquake loading condition that is seismic hazard analysis, we are basically trying to identify what is the potential ground motion which is likely to occur. So, if we are talking about uh, probabilistic hazard analysis, which we have also discussed in earlier lectures. So, the objective was to find out what is the potential ground motion which my building is expected to 
fitness during its design life which will govern which will govern the 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 design of the building so i have to ensure as a designer i have to ensure that whatever components i am designing each of these components and overall my structure should be able to withstand the most likely to occur ground vibration at my site of interest so this is about the earthquake loading condition now many a times uh, we discuss that whenever there is an earthquake there are lot of building damages because earthquake loading will transfer vibration to buildings depending upon the building characteristics these vibrations some of them will be able to withstand some of them will undergo minor damage some of them will undergo complete collapse recently during 2023 turkey earthquake also we have seen lot of devastations lot of building damages lot of uneven settlement lot of cracks foundation failure so many things were witnessed during different different locations during uh, maybe we can say about main earthquake or after shocks so that means uh, whenever we are interested to find out earthquake loading we are not only restricting ourselves in order to find out what is the potential ground motion definitely this information has to be utilized somewhere in order to mitigate if the scenario which has happened during 2023 turkey earthquake in terms of devastation it's basically the response of your system whether you are talking about a uh, parking lot whether you are talking about a bridge whether you are talking about a building whether you are talking about uh, a tower whether you are talking about cable suspension uh, supports bridge abutments so all of these are basically the system which will be exposed to earthquake induced loading if these are not designed properly these will undergo failure so one is about the vulnerability which we will be talking in today's class about what is vulnerability that means whenever uh, an earthquake has happened we have to basically correlate with respect to what is the most likely to occur ground motion and how this ground motion is going to define the stability of a particular building the safety of its intended users so that will come under seismic vulnerability and risk so once you go to risk we can we can even find out what is the potential exposure of a particular building and its intended user whenever there is an earthquake involved or there is an earthquake scenario likely to occur during maybe in uh, a definite exposure period so lecture 28 it is basically the the understanding about seismic vulnerability and risk has been divided in general into three lectures so today we will be discussing uh, we will be giving an overview about what is vulnerability how it is correlated with respect to hazard and how vulnerability hazard can be correlated with respect to the risk so this is part 1 and subsequently lecture 29 and 30 will be part 2 and part 3 for seismic vulnerability as well as risk so we know different earthquakes which are happening across the globe in this particular table we are discussing about some of the important earthquakes which have happened from time to time in different sections of himalayas and definitely in other locations primarily in the indian subcontinent so carefully looking at these earthquakes we'll get an idea about it's not only the uh, the seismic activity of a particular source in terms of producing maybe major earthquake great earthquakes moderate earthquakes but also every time when there is an earthquake there are lot of lives which are getting lost there are lot of people which are getting injured there are lot of buildings which are undergoing collapse or damages which are beyond repair at the same time because now there is there has been some earthquake as a result of which there has been fatalities there have been uh, there have been building damages also so government and the local agency they will put lot of the money in terms of restoring the buildings which are uh, involved there or in case there is some complete collapse then people have to be undergo rehabilitation so again there also in order to bring uh, more or less the condition back to normal or at least close to normal in order to remove uh, debris in order to continue uh, transportation in order to apply, uh, supply food in order to supply essential medicines communications to hit areas during a particular earthquake lot of finance also undergoes uh, has to be pumped into the uh, system so so not only the fatalities definitely when people are losing life that is should, that is the most important 
concern related to earthquake occurrence. But at the same time, in addition to this, lot of money which otherwise should have been used in development of infrastructure, in uh, securing health as well as uh, uh, basic infrastructure facilities could have been uh, arranged. Now, this money has gone into rehabilitation work. So, definitely it is going to affect your, your overall development of the society. So, whenever we are discussing about seismic vulnerability and risk, the overall target is to find out what are the potential locations which are more prone to earthquake effects. When we talk about effects, that means building collapse as well as the life of its intended users. Earlier also I mentioned that many a time it has been seen that particularly the fatalities are directly a function of at what time of the day the earthquake has happened. If the earthquake has happened during late, time, late night, that means where majority of the residents were inside their houses and the building has undergone complete collapse. Definitely in this particular case, the fatalities will be significantly higher in comparison to if the same earthquake has happened during the day night, uh, day time when most of the people who were outside, maybe they were in the market, they were traveling or some of them were there in their offices, some of them were in open area. So, in comparison to rest place, people were sleeping and suddenly hit by an earthquake and the building, building undergoes damage. Definitely, the chances for these people to go to an open area will be relatively less or in comparison to other people uh, um, where the earthquake has happened during broad daylight and whenever any earthquake shaking is there or when people are told that uh, some, uh, some warning has been issued that there is an earthquake which is going to hit, people can go to safer location. So, if it is happening during day night, uh, daylight, then there are definitely more chances that relatively lesser fatalities will be there. Building damage is independent of uh, what time of the day you are, uh, your earthquake is hitting your site of interest. But definitely the fatalities are directly related to, at least in many of the earthquake it has been seen, that fatalities are directly a function of what time of the day the earthquake has happened. Okay, so, looking at this particular figure, we can get an idea about that 1255 there was an earthquake in Kathmandu in Nepal and the fatalities were close to 1 lakh. Similarly, 1555 again there was an earthquake in Srinagar, fatalities were close to 60,000. And subsequently, we can see about more earthquakes which have happened in an, uh, in different parts of Indian uh, subcontinent starting with the uh, 1255 Kathmandu earthquake. Similarly, 1897 there was an earthquake in Shillong, magnitude was 8.1, but considering the, uh, the population density there was relatively less. So, you can see close to 1500 people lost their lives. 1950 again there was an earthquake in Assam, close to 8.5 was the magnitude and 1526 people lost their lives. 2005 there was an earthquake in uh, Pakistan, uh, Kashmir, close to 7.6 magnitude and close to 80,000 people lost their lives. So, 2005 is quite recent and in comparison to 1255 when 1 lakh fatalities were there even in 2005. So, primarily it is related to the construction practice, how sound is the construction happened at a particular site and secondly about the population density. So, many a times uh, locations which are which are very uh, which are in close proximity to very active uh, seismic sources and are also having very high population density. So, those are the regions which have one has to be more careful that if similar earthquakes are going to happen in near future definitely the, the population size which is going to get affected by the occurrence of this earthquake is significantly larger. So, if you talk the population density in terms of what was there during 18, uh, 1255, where close to 1 lakh people lost their life, current population density will be much more. It will be many fo mo manifold increased in comparison to 1255 uh, population density. So, if same earthquake is going to hit even today, or even 1905 earthquake is going to hit even today, then depending upon again there where, where this particular earthquake is happening, the fatalities will be significantly higher because population density is very high and many a times the equal contribution comes from the, the, the type of construction, how, how proper is the construction material chosen, how uh, effective is the design and uh, reinforcement and all those things. 
So, uh, this particular uh, table gives an idea about that not every time there has been an earthquake which is happening from maybe across different centuries, but at the same time whenever there is an earthquake there are lives which are involved, there are lives which have been lost during these particular earthquakes. So, every time when there is earthquake it is not only the vibration, so far we were discussing about vibration, but there is life which is also getting lost at the same time, life should be given the top priority. Now, this is about the fatalities, again we have another table on the right, again we can see here over here 2010 there was an earthquake, Haiti earthquake where the death toll was in the range of 46 to 3 lakh 16 thousand, again so many people very recent 2010 Haiti earthquake. 2011 there was an earthquake in Japan, Sendai earthquake. So, again we can see the, the death toll was close to 21,000 people and close to 1.108 million people became homeless. So, it is like not only people are losing their lives, but because of building collapse people are also losing their uh, homes. So, they are becoming homeless, close to 140 million US dollar of economic loss has happened just because of 2011. Tohoku earthquake. Again 2011 there was an earthquake in Turkey leading to economic loss of 2.2 billion US dollars. So, keeping the fatalities it is most important, but keeping fatalities also aside at the same time there is a lot of finance which are getting lost because of rehabilitation, because of food supply essential uh, items. And, and many more things. 2011 again there was an earthquake in Sikkim of magnitude 6.8. So, again Sikkim we see the fat, uh, fatalities uh, were also there, but at the same time close to 1.7 billion US dollars of economic loss was triggered or had happened during 2011 Sikkim earthquake. 2015 there was an earthquake in Pokhara, Nepal close to 10,000 people lost their lives and uh, again number of people lost their lives can be slightly varying and economic loss was close to 290 million US dollars. So, again we can see every time there is an earthquake we are having fatalities as given in table on the left and in addition to those fatalities there are lot of economic loss which is also getting involved primarily because of building damages and other infrastructural damage because it is it is kind of complete devastation. So, not even only human lives, but all type of infrastructure is also getting badly affected and when near time it is getting complete collapse. Similarly, 2023 there was earthquake in February 2023 there was earthquake in Turkey Syria uh, that particular location. So, again fatality was close to 56,000 and close to 80 billion US dollars. Again this figure has been taken from the existing literature. So, there is significant uh, variation in terms of the, the economic losses. So, every time why, why we am insisting on this particular part that uh, understanding about uh, past earthquake, understanding about the activity of a particular fault or maximum potential earthquake or seismic activity or hazard analysis. That's, that certainly is the objective uh, to know about the uh, uh, seismicity of a particular region or how active the, is a particular region in terms of earthquake occurrence, but at the same time this understanding or outcome from seismic hazard also has to be looked into from fatalities or building collapse point of view, which is primarily the objective for vulnerability and risk assessment. Now, risk when we are talking about risk particularly about seismic risk, it is basically how much is the disaster, potential disaster loss which is going to occur. If you are talking about seismic risk, what is the potential disaster which is going to occur primarily because of a particular earthquake. If you are talking about one particular earthquake scenario, if you are talking about a particular region, we have to take into account the potential scenarios and then try to determine the risk. So, definitely this is in terms of property loss as well as in terms of health loss, in terms of life loss, livelihood loss, people are losing their entire building where offices was set up that is gone. So, again livelihood also their markets are there, shops are there, livelihood is also getting completely lost. Asset, infrastructure property people are losing, services, 
telecommunication services, health services, uh, maybe if uh, gas pipelines are also there, those are also getting badly affected. So, this all this information, all these kinds of disasters which are primarily, primarily related to lives, related to livelihood, asset or services resulting in the form of disaster which are happening during a particular community or a particular society. And it is not like happening at present or happened in the past, primarily when we are talking about risk that means, what is the potential risk involved for a particular scenario. I am talking about earthquake here or I am talking about tsunami, I can talk in terms of fire, I can talk about uh, uh, drought, ground subsidence. So, all these different kinds of uh, whether it is again about natural uh, uh, phenomena or we are talking about anthropogenic activities. Every time when there is any activity involved, how this particular activity, how this particular phenomena whether it is man made or whether it is uh, 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 natural, how it is going to affect in terms of all these things during a fixed exposure period. So, I am interested to find out how much the risk involved for next 20 years, next 25 years, next 30 years. If you are talking about uh, hazard, so the, that means in terms of earthquake occurrence, how much is the risk involved which can, which can result in loss of lives it can result in health status, degrading the health status, loss in the livelihood, services, assets during maybe next 25 years, 30 years, 35 years. So, that is going to definitely give us an idea about how much is the risk involved and definitely if you are talking about the mitigation plan, if you are talking about uh, how to deal with the disaster which is likely to occur in next 25 years, next 10 years, next 30 years. It is not only that uh, only at the end of 25 years you are going to experience an earthquake, because it is the site is located or the region is located in such a way that once in every 6 months or once in every 2 years you are expecting one moderate to great earthquakes, moderate earthquakes or maybe large earthquakes and once in maybe 15 years, 20 years, 100 years you are experience, you are uh, uh, expecting to experience one great earthquakes. So, certainly uh, down the line if you are starting from today, maybe next 5 years, how much is the risk involved in terms of all these parameters, because of uh, seismic scenario which might be generated because of one or maybe different seismic sources that will come under risk. And accordingly, we can, we can uh, come up with the policies like how one can deal with whether in terms of uh, developing shelters, whether in terms of uh, uh, issuing warnings, whether in terms of training people like how one has to respond during a particular earthquake. Definitely, the seismic scenario which was actually resulting in disaster or loss of lives can be reduced significantly. If, if we are having proper uh, mitigation plan and of course, followed by a regular training to its intended user. Uh, when what they are supposed to do, when they are exposed to a particular seismic scenario or when are they are supposed to expose to any other kind of natural disaster. So, this is of course, whenever we are talking about risk, there will be always some exposure period. How much is that exposure period? I cannot determine the risk for infinite time, because every seismic scenario or every natural phenomena will be having will be corresponding to some probability of occurrence. When we are talking about tsunami, it will be a happening at different frequency in comparison to earthquake. Similarly, in terms of fire, in, comes, in terms of drought, in, in terms of uh, maybe landslide, if landslide is there, what if a particular si slide which is more uh, prone to failure undergoes failure in next 20 years, 30 years, what are the areas which will undergo complete collapse? or what are the li uh, lives which are involved which might undergo uh, which will be lost. So, all those things we can discuss in terms of risk. Definitely, three things will come into picture. One is what is the loading you are getting if you are talking about sl slow failure definitely because of the failure of the material how much is the load involved, what is the triggering mechanism that will also be there, what is the exposure if I am designing or assessing the risk at today. Then considering what is the chance that the slope or maybe number of slopes to undergo failure in next 20 years, next 30 years, next 40 years. Accordingly, 
taking into account the probability of failure in next 20 years, I will determine what is the risk which my site is exposed to for next 20 years. So, hazard has also come into picture, exposure period also is, has come into picture. Next part will be vulnerability. What is the characteristics of the system which actually is undergoing failure? If you are talking about uh, uh, maybe a building, what is the characteristics of the building which actually differentiating uh, uh, or actually helping us to find out what is uh, what is the suitability of a building to withstand maybe uh, slopes uh, failure scenario or maybe earthquake scenario. So, vulnerability will come into picture, exposure will come into picture and definitely the loading condition. So, if you are talking about seismic part, seismic hazard will also come into picture. So, definitely a risk it is expected, it is a measure of how much is the expected loss. If you are talking about hazard, how much is the expected loss which is likely to occur during a particular seismic scenario and we are talking about seismic scenario definitely during a particular magnitude earthquake. If you are talking about uh, uh, deterministic one, if you are talking about probabilistic one, then again depending upon what is the frequency of occurrence you are targeting, you can find out what is the seismic scenario. More precisely, if you are going with the probabilistic one, you can go with deaggregation and find out what is the worst scenario of magnitude and distance combination. So, that can also be used over here. Risk, it is a function of hazard as I mentioned, because it is directly related to how much lives are at stake. Definitely, we have to have an understanding about how much is the loading which is going to come, what is the duration in which I am expected to know the potential loading. Thirdly, when this loading is being applied, where this particular loading is being exposed to, whether it will be applied to a particular building, whether it will be applied to a particular tower, whether it will be applied to uh, a particular parking area or any other thing such that there should be a component of risk. So, vulnerability means I am interested to find out where actually you are going to apply and then depending upon the characteristics of that particular superstructure, that particular uh, 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 maybe tower, that particular building, that particular parking area, I can find out the vulnerability. And of course, I can also take into account the uh, subsoil medium characteristics also into account while assessing the vulnerability. So, risk it is a function of it is a collective function of hazard that means the loading condition for what duration I am expecting a particular loading condition. If you remember probabilistic hazard analysis there also we were telling that this is a particular seismic scenario like 0 0.1 g, 0 0.15 g, 0 0.2 g, 0 0.23 g. So, that was the spectral acceleration which my site was expected to experience. How much? Maybe the chances that this particular uh, ground motion of spectral acceleration will not expose uh, like 90 percent or 98 percent probability was there that it is not going to expose during the next 50 years. So, if you recall, we were having primarily two definition that means 2 percent probability that my ground motion which are uh, which I am going to give based on probabilistic hazard analysis, it is not going to experience, it is not going to exceed during maybe next 50 years, next 60 years depending upon what is the exposure period I am defining in my calculation. So, in probabilistic hazard analysis, we were giving the seismic scenario corresponding to seismic hazard corresponding to some particular exposure period. So, depending upon your design life of the structure or if you are targeting for some scenario, Accordingly, we can we can define the user can define how much is the exposure one is uh, expecting to use corresponding to risk assessment. Remember, more exposure, more longer duration one is one is interested in terms of assessing the risk that particular uh, uh, hazard values again will go increasing because you are you are interested basically if you, I am increasing the exposure that means I want to ensure suppose I am, I am, I am considering exposure for 20 years and another way I am considering exposure of 80 years. So, that means whenever I am going with mitigation I am interested to find out like how much seismic scenario my building will be exposed in next 20 years and how much seismic scenario my building will be exposed to in next 80 years. So, certainly in next 80 years the ground motion expected will be relatively more because 
Now, your building is exposed for longer duration in the site. So, certainly there will be lot of uncertainty in terms of ground motion which will be available that will definitely increase the magnitude of hazard value which my building will be exposed to if the building if the exposure period I am considering as 80 years. Similarly, if I am going with uh, probability of accidents, if I am taking as 2 percent probability of accidents that means, I am ensuring that 98 percent chances are there. My ground motion in next 50 years, next 30 years, next 40 years is not going to exceed the ground motion which I am giving based on my hazard analysis. Similarly, if I reduce this probability from 98 percent to 90 percent that means, I am interested to find out the spectral acceleration corresponding to 10 percent probability in 50 years. That means, I am ensuring whatever ground motion I am going to give 90 percent chances are there this ground motion is not going to exceed your site is never going to experience ground motion beyond or above the spectral acceleration which I am giving based on probabilistic hazard analysis and this probability that it is not going to exceed it is 90 percent it may exceed that chances is 10 percent. So, all those things will come under hazard as well as exposure period. In addition to this when we are going with risk we have to also take into account what is the vulnerability, what is the system characteristics on which hazard will be applied for a definite exposure period. So, when these three components are there definitely I will be having all the important information related to risk assessment. So, seismic hazard we have discussed, uh, we, we take into account all the seismic scenarios or uh, uh, the seismic activity of all the adjoining faults which are available in your seismotectonic region, determine the value of seismic hazard, take that into account, you can go with seismic performance because not only one uh, set of ground motion characteristics will be potentially occurring at or your site will be exposed to, you will be having lot of ground motion characteristics which are which we, where chances are there that these can um, undergo variation, these may change whenever a seismic scenario is going to hit your site of interest. So, definitely one has to go with seismic performance based design. So, corresponding to different sets of ground motions, what is the performance your building or your structure is going to uh, show whenever we go for uh, stability analysis of a particular building or uh, uh, when we are trying to find out the analysis of a particular building or a particular structure to above seismic hazard. Based on this, we can define, user can define the damage characteristics. So, fragility analysis is going to tell us what is the correlation between the ground motion and uh, the damages which are going to, which are likely to happen at a particular structure. Because now the structure is exposed to particular ground vibration definitely there might be some critical joints. If you are going with building, you can go de develop the damage characteristics of the building in terms of fragility curves. If you are going with maybe a small connections, maybe an operating machines or maybe pipe connections, you can go with development of fragility curves for different different important components. So, this fragility curve is going to give us an understanding about with the change in ground motion properties, what is the chance my damage characteristics of the critical component will vary. I can define the damage whether the damage at this particular threshold value should be considered as minor damage, beyond that it should be considered as more damage and then depending upon the, uh, the critical values I can also define like corresponding to what level of damage I can say it has complete collapse. So, all those char characteristics will come under fragility curves. It is basically going to give you an understanding about what is the correlation between your ground motion which will be exposed to your building and corresponding if your ground motion is very low, what is the uh, percentage damage. If the ground motion is moderate, what is again the damage. If the ground motion is very high, what is the damage. Definitely, it will not be the seismic hazard value alone, but it will be the complete picture of the ground motion characteristics which will help us in finding out what is the damage characteristics. Damage characteristics. So, I am interested to find out based on the based on the design of the building, based on the literature also, we can find out what are the critical components if 
if those undergo failure, the entire structure whether the building, whether the beam, whether the column remains stable, but it is going to uh, co compromise the safety of a particular structure. So, that means, we have to find out what are the critical components, which are basically ensuring the safety of a particular structure. Uh, critical example is, if you are going with nuclear power plants, the critical component is maybe some uh, pipe connections, maybe some machine operation, some movements of uh, some mechanical components whose movements are also critical. Primarily, it may be related to during the time when the power plant is undergoing in it is in running condition or when there is any kind of radiation leak, then again there are lot of safety measures. So, if suppose there was some seismic scenario because of which the there are chances that radiation may undergo uh, uh, leakage, then lot of uh, safety measures will come into picture, which will the, the objective of those safety measure is to prevent any kind of movement, whether it is in terms of mechanical component, whether it is in terms of some pipelines, which are providing essentials in order to arrest the reaction. So, these are basically the important components. Whenever we are going with seismic fragility analysis, in order to, in addition to find out the probabilistic hazard analysis, which the particular building, which a particular uh, reactor building will be exposed to, we can also try determining what is the potential of damage in terms of uh, ground motion characteristics, which your site is exposed to, such that now I, I know the fragility curve of my critical component, I can define accordingly like if my structure is exposed to this particular level of uh, 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 ground motion, then the critical component will be able to withstand that ground motion. If the structure is exposed to higher ground motion, this component may undergo partial failure or it may undergo total failure. So, those kinds of understanding we can develop for critical components for a particular structure. These critical component can be defined by uh, the intended user or if you are talking about specific buildings may be uh, well defined codal provisions are there in order to find out what are the critical components for which one can go with development of fragility curves. So, we have we started with seismic hazard then take it into a consideration corresponding to the potential uh, ground motion scenario, we perform the seismic performance uh, design, how the system is going to respond and corresponding to that response one can determine the fragility curves, which is going to give you an understanding about the potential damage. Taking that into account, we can perform the vulnerability assessment. That means, you are having the building characteristics, you are having some understanding about uh, the plan of the building, the aerial view of the building, the construction material uh, used in, in, in the building, then you can continue with the seismic assessment, because you will be having the characteristics of the building as well as you will be having some characteristics of seismic hazard as well. Collectively, you can take into account for a known exposure period, what will be the risk involved, because from seismic hazard, you know it is corresponding to some exposure period. Based on fragility, you will be able to determine the vulnerability and then taking all those components, we can determine the value of seismic risk. Now, again going back to the hazard, we have discussed in earlier uh, lectures also about hazard, both the deterministic hazard analysis, which is going to give us an understanding about the worst in a scenario, which is uh, corresponding to generally, which is corresponding to uh, the maximum magnitude of earthquake happening on most likely to uh, most uh, earthquake causing fault or the fault, which is very close to your site of interest. And again on that particular fault, the earthquake of maximum magnitude is happening at location, which is closest to your site of interest. So, that was the definition of deterministic and then dealing with the uncertainty with respect to earthquake size, in terms of earthquake magnitude, in terms of location and ground motion accidents, we have another approach that is called as probabilistic hazard analysis. So, those we have discussed probabilistic hazard analysis or deterministic hazard analysis, it is basically going to give us corresponding to a particular earthquake, if we are talking about seismic hazard, it is going to give us what is the uh, magnitude of uh, loading, which is expected at your site of interest. So, if you are talking about uh, seismic hazard, it is going to tell us how much is the earthquake loading, which are likely to be exposed 
at your site of interest that actually can cause building damage and later on can lead to loss of lives, injury and other health impacts can be there. Similarly, property damages can be there, asset damages can be there. So, all these things which are basically triggered losses all those which have been triggered primarily because of occurrence of a particular hazard. Now, it can be seismic hazard, it can be other kind of natural hazards or anthropogenic hazards, but primary the, the, the purpose here is to find out that how much, how much is the loading you are going to get because of a particular earthquake or because of uh, maybe tsunami, because of any other natural phenomena or if you are talking about blast anthropogenic activities then corresponding to blasting if you are going to uh, design some bunkers then again you have you can take into account the characteristics of that particular loading and then try determining the blast related hazard values. So, that can also come into picture in terms of hazard assessment uh, depending upon what kind of hazard you are dealing with the corresponding value of loading on a particular infrastructure where you are interested to find out like if, if I am in a particular region I am interested to find out the hazard value that means I am going to find out how much is the loading which my infrastructure seismic hazard is there then building if you are talking about blasting then maybe bunkers or any other airfields strips. So, there also you can take into account directly the measure of how much is the magnitude of particular loading condition. Hazard can be so need not be the current hazard, but considering the past scenarios which, which uh, uh, we have in terms of literature whether you are talking about earthquake hazard, whether you are talking about uh, landslide or any other tsunami hazard take into account what has happened in the past and based on that in the light of that particular information and existing models try to forecast what should be the scenario for future considering latent condition considering the existing what is the condition what should be the scenario which is likely to emerge in next 10 years 15 years and as I mentioned earlier also that uh, the scenario keep on changing if you are talking for next 5 years prediction it may be different 10 year prediction definitely you are playing with more more with the uncertainties because not only the earthquake, but lot other activities are also changing in and around of a particular site which may not be changing significantly in next uh, 5 years, but it can change in next 15 years 20 years like that. And moreover mo longer is the duration of exposure there are more chances that some earthquake which are happening at longer distance uh, longer duration may also be exposed to your building which perhaps you were not anticipating in next 10 years but will occur in next definitely next 50 years. Okay, so, hazard include latent condition they may that may represent future threats it may be uh, anthropogenic or it can be um, uh, human uh, natural. So, both will uh, give us an understanding about what is the future threat or what is the future loading scenario threat again uh, we can replace with respect to the loading scenario which is actually going to compromise the safety of a particular infrastructure if you are going with the uh, human activities it is again going to directly implicate on the risk values. So, these can be natural or it can be anthropogenic or man made each hazard is characterized primarily by means of location where it is more or less intensity how much more or less frequency again how frequently these hazards are going to be experienced and the probability of occurrence. So, this we have already discussed in probabilistic hazard analysis then hazard analysis is related to the identification and monitoring of any kind of hazard. So, we when we are talking about seismic hazard we also go with uh, early warning systems when we are talking about tsunami hazard lot of information can be used in terms of developing useful warnings for uh, tsunami warnings that will give us primarily an alarm before the actual loading hit your site of interest certainly building cannot be saved, but at least the people who are living can be moved to safer locations. So, seismic hazard accounts for damage to property if directly not damage it will be related to loading and then loading in addition to building characteristics will lead to damage characteristics of the earthquake to uh, particular seismic scenario and definitely when the building undergoes damages there will be lives 
which are also involved. So, injury uh, and uh, uh, fatalities will also come into picture. So, seismic hazard analysis re, uh, requires quantitative assessment of how much is the ground motion which is exposed at a particular site during a particular exposure period. The knowledge of seismic hazard analysis, if we know into, uh, if we know well in advance like what is the seismic loading which is going to be experienced in next 20 years, that definitely you can use in terms of retrofitting the existing infrastructure, in terms of assessing the damage characteristics of the infrastructure which you cannot uh, uh, repair it, maybe the uh, because of n number of reasons and thirdly, whenever you are going for new infrastructure development, definitely this knowledge is going to give you lot important information in terms of uh, uh, mitigation of the future damages. Vulnerability, it is basically the characteristics and circumstances of a particular system, community, when it is exposed to the damaging characteristics of a particular hazard. As I mentioned, if you are talking about uh, the vulnerability of a particular system, that means how vulnerable or what is the characteristics of the system when it will be subjected to a particular hazard that will come under vulnerability. That means that will make it susceptible. Susceptible means whenever earthquake loading is there, how the characteristics of the building is going to change whenever it will be subjected to uh, earthquake loading condition. So, it is a concept that describes factors or constraints of economic, social, physical, geographic that can reduce the ability of the community to prepare for or to cope up with the impact of the hazard. So, that means vulnerability is going to directly tell us when this particular hazard is being exposed to a particular community, whether community is going to withstand it or it is going to uh, whether it is going to cope up or it will undergo kind of failure. So, reduce the ability of community to prepare that will be more uh, inclination towards vulnerability. So, if I am talking about more vulnerable that means, the chances of adaptability, the chances to be prepared for a particular hazard scenario will be lesser. So, that means, there, those are more vulnerable. A disaster happens when a hazard interact with the vulnerability. So, that means, when vulnerability is more and then subsequently loading also applied to the system that will result in disaster. It can be again man made or it can be natural. So, disaster affect the population primarily if, if, if there are buildings involved, whether it is because of bombing, whether it is because of tsunami, whether it is because of seismic activity. Finally, the building which was vulnerable or which was designed, which was declared as vulnerable because of these loading conditions will undergo failure if any of these loading conditions are exposed, your building is exposed to when it will undergo failure, there will be loss of lives because there are people who are living there. So, where there is physical, infrastructural, environmental and socio-economic con uh, consequences related to vulnerability as well as exposure to a particular hazard. So, seismic vulnerability is defined as the tendency of the structure to undergo structural or non-structural failure or damages in case of a seismic event. So, if we are talking about seismic vulnerability, that means we are talking about what is the chances that building will be able to withstand that seismic loading or not and accordingly that will define that building is vulnerable or it is not vulnerable. So, seismic vulnerability again one can do with using empirical method where you can actually identify based on rapid visual screening you can find out what is the characteristics of the building, what type of soil the building is located, what type of uh, uh, what type of uh, uh, construction material which has been used in terms of uh, constructing this particular building. So, all those things will come under there and then you are having an analytical method where you can use into you can go with modeling and find out the response of the building to a large set of ground motion characteristics. You can go with pushover analysis, you can go with non-linear analysis in order to find out actually what is the vulnerability of at least the critical components of the building or any other infrastructure. So, whenever we go with empirical method, it is based on post earthquake scenario. If you are going like some earthquake has happened and later on you are interested to find out the vulnerability studies or damage studies, you can you can you can refer to uh, standard charts and correlate with respect to 
what kind of damage you are seeing in a particular site which has been affected during a particular earthquake. Similarly, if you can you can use pre event buildings also in order to find out whether those were vulnerable or not and the same concept can be extended to existing building which are actually we, we try to understand what will the vulnerability of those buildings. So, characteristics of the building can be taken into account in order to find out whether the building will be vulnerable or not vulnerable. Again we can refer to EMS 98 method also in order to uh, go for vulnerability assessment based on empirical method. Analytical method it will take care more on quantitative assessment of vulnerability or in terms of damage characteristics of the building primarily related to pushover analysis. So, where you can correlate the seismic demand of a particular structure and then how much is the loading the structure is exposed to. You can again go with non-linear time history analysis also in order to find out the degradation in the uh, components over the period of seismic loading condition. So, EMS method, empirical method, the damage classification based on European micro seismic scale which is which is defining. So, we can see based on the damage characteristics you can define whether it is about masonry building, whether it is about concrete building you can define by by observing the damages which has happened during a particular earthquake with respect to pre event building. So, grade 1 it is related to negligible to slight damages of non structural members, hairline cracks in very few walls fall of small pieces of plaster only. So, this is the characteristics based on which you can say grade 1 kind of damage has happened to a particular building. Similarly, with respect to grade 2 moderate damage slight structural component undergoes damage cracks in many walls fall of hair uh, very large pieces of plaster partial collapse of chimney as well as mumties. So, those will be again if these are the scenario which you have experienced during a particular earthquake to a building and keeping in account the information about the building which was there before the earthquake has happened. So, that collectively can help us in understanding what was the damage because it should not happen like before a particular earthquake has happened the building some of these characteristics the building was already experienced. Then certainly that will not be called as damage to the building during a particular earthquake. Second uh, similar classification we can get similar details we can get classification of damages to reinforced concrete buildings. Similarly, classification of 3, 4, 5 are also there. So, we can say class grade number 4 very heavy damage particularly to structural damage with very heavy non structural members. So, structural members means load, load bearing members which are directly offering resistance to external loading condition those have also experienced heavy damages non structural members they have experienced very heavy damage. Grade 5 it is complete destructions or collapse of the building. If you are going with grade 5 for case of reinforced concrete building then again it is called as destruction, destruction of uh, primarily the structural members followed by which collapse of ground floor parts. So, you can say maybe uh, wings or maybe uh, loss of shear uh, reinforcement or confinement uh, to the structural members which has happened during a particular earthquake. So, based on that you can find out like uh, grade 5 kind of damage has happened to uh, reinforced concrete structures. Okay, so, again based on rep, uh, rapid visual screening what we do here the most popular method in order to find out the vulnerability assessment or in order to find out how much is the vulnerability of a particular building there we take into account it was it was developed by a forensic invest emergency management agency FEMA in 1998. The second edition was given in 2002 and recently in 2015 the third edition has come. It is a cost effective method visual screening means just by sidewalk for 15 to 30 is required in order to observe each and every building you go around the building and find out the characteristics which are mentioned over here and based on these characteristics you can classify RVS value rapid visual screening value of a particular building which will also help us in understanding what should be the grade in which the potential damage is likely to occur during a particular earthquake. 
So, surveyor need to be an ex, need not be an expert or a structural engineer, but certain points are given. One can be trained for those points. You go to a particular site, all about that particular site, and observe particular site with respect to those points. Interior, if can be accessed because many a time buildings are not accessible because of uh, many reasons. So, if interior is also accessible, that gives additional confidence to the RVS value. If it is not there, then we can restrict ourselves to whatever you are observing based on sidewalks. Okay, so, I will stop here and uh, we will further continue this particular discussion to lecture number 29 and then subsequently to lecture number 30th. Thank you. Thank you.